What's up, internet? It's me, Jake Cobrin, and you are listening to another episode of the Quarantine Sessions podcast. I began to record episodes for this podcast at the beginning of the year 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic, and the inspiration behind these podcasts was to provide a platform for the pillars and leaders of my community to share their voice and to help construct an inspiring narrative for people in this time of crisis when a need for the upliftment of the spirit has been at its most urgent. This podcast centers around themes of art, creativity, spirituality, and psychedelics. And the incredible people I've had conversations with are all people who have bravely stepped outside of the conventional way of thinking and the conventional way of being and have transcended the matrix of the default reality, living life on their own terms. They are all people I respect deeply, and it has been an amazing opportunity and a privilege to speak to and learn from them. Most of these podcasts have been recorded live through Instagram, which is a new and somewhat experimental medium to conduct podcasts. I truly hope you enjoy this podcast and continue to tune in for future episodes. It's really a labor of love on my part. And thank you so much again for listening. Without further ado, here's the show. What's up, guys? This is a fun one today with my friend, the ungoogleable Michelangelo. Michelangelo is a loquacious, verbose, witty, creative anomaly. It's hard to classify Michelangelo. He does a lot of things. He has his own podcast called Self-Portraits as Other People. He is a writer, a poet, a musician, and a painter, as well as an actor. He is the one and only founder and the only member, besides his many multiple personalities, of Void Denison, which is his psychedelic rap music project. We talked about a lot of things. Um, it was fun conversation and I don't want to spoil it for you. So just listen to the podcast. You'll like it. I promise. Just listen to it. Just do it. Just, just all right. It's happening. Am I visible? Am I visible and audible? You're visible and audible. Beautiful. You know, Beautiful. While we wait for the, uh, the folks to gather, beyond audibility and visibility, I've got some like sensual dimensions that they'll never be able to touch. Wow. Figured we'd start off with the old peeling of the orange to build some suspense, you know, for the folks I just, thought, I just thought because we have about an hour that maybe I could just drink this matcha. Ooh, we, got, watch. we got some nice colors going on, man. Yeah, it's nice, nice shade of, various shades of green. Did you ever see the film The Congress? Are you familiar no. with that? So it's um, Robin Wright, or Robin Wright Penn, I guess she was at some point. She plays herself in this film, and it's kind of about the future of cinema. And she plays her last role, which is to say she has her every nuance scanned so that they can replicate her in whatever situation they want. And then it flashes forward 20 years in which the future of cinema is no longer where you're just watching somebody on a screen and kind of empathizing with them. But it's like you huff this chemical from a tube and you basically transport yourself into the imagination of becoming that person. So you become Humphrey Bogart or whoever. And wow. uh, so I was thinking it would be cool if somebody who's watching at home right now has a cup of matcha or an orange, they can enjoy alongside us and transport themselves into the experience of being either a Yaakov Cobrini or an ungoogleable Michelangelo. Yeah. I love this effect on your eyes, man. On these, yeah, I don't, it's, yeah, it's fantastic. The, the test screen 
from the old television stations. That, that to yeah. me was always the, uh, the Buddha on the path. That was like the final frontier right before the, uh, the white noise static would <laughs> take you the into Bardo the beyond. Realms, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Techno Bardo. You just, you just go into the VHS noise realm yes. on your way out. So, Michelangelo, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you. Good You're to be probably here with best you. known for those really dope murals in the Vatican, right? Which I've well, seen pictures of, and it's pretty impressive. It's pretty good work. Yeah, it's a common misunderstanding, Jacob, that people confuse me with Michelangelo. But, you know, it's a different spelling, and I also get confused for that, uh, that turtle, the party dude. Oh, the turtle, yeah. No, I, my murals, strangely enough, I did do some, almost, dare I say, almost Sistine Chapel-esque murals that were all destroyed shortly after their creation. One of them was actually in what, what manners, eating with a mouthful of orange. What unbelievable. Um, in San Francisco, in um, Ocean Beach, I did a huge mural that I worked on for like six months. Because really? I, I never knew any other muralists at the time. And now I see like you or like my friend Lauren YS and they'll throw up like a huge mural in like a couple days. But I was literally like doing murals like I would do a painting with like the tiniest little brushes and just putting so much detail and just working like for six months on these masterpieces. And then um, because of varying reasons, they were undone before they ever really got much attention, uh, which mm. is a large part of my artistic trauma that has pushed me into different realms of expression. Thank mm. God. Yeah. Well, the world wasn't ready yet. I'm sure whatever you were bringing through, it just, yeah, people weren't, weren't ready for that. You probably would have blown their minds and uh, done, you know, irrevocable damage to their psyches had they seen that. So oh, it's the, probably- Oh, the these, me these Mephistophelian ambitions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to opening up portals and summoning void knows what. World you is and inspired. I are both, uh, I think we're both in the portal opening business. The uh, the mind blowing business, you know, it's a uh, PR it's an for infinity. PR for infinity, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a, it's honest work, you know. It is. It doesn't always pay, but uh, neither <laughs> this crime and the crime of creation is the uh, the ultimate form to be complicit in. I think we can uh, yeah. just look at these look at these mug shots right here. How are you doing, man? I'm doing all right. I'm actually, it has been a minute. It's been uh, a dilated minute. Uh, at the moment, I'm actually doing really well. I'm feeling really good today. I'm, I'm kind of on a little manic uh, episode and dealing with a lot of insomnia, you know, kind of like dreading falling asleep and then waking up is also not very pleasurable. It's kind of like this feeling of like, mm. kind of like a chemical hangover, maybe from uh, lack of sunshine or oxytocin, but Overall, I'm feeling I, I've kind of gone through some shadow portals in the last few weeks and uh, kind of like took my spiritual machete into the Jungian jungle and, uh, you know, nice. slayed some uh, some archetypes and uh, come out on the awesome. other side currently feeling uh, pretty good and feeling pretty excited. I was actually very excited about this little talk because falling asleep last night, I was starting to catch some glimpses of what was to come. So I'm glad to now be submerged in that anticipatory cool. present yeah and you're in la right now i am but you know from being inside all the time which i'm kind of was you know pre-quarantine as well I, I might as well be anywhere right yeah that's interesting what's the situation over there like how long um like what are the restrictions and for how long um well we're not allowed to eat pork and <laughs> <laughs> we have to brush our teeth twice a day. They're very, you know, very strict about all that. Um, you know, we have to wear only black clothes. And no, they're, um, I, I, I'm, not even, I'm not even that sure what the restrictions are aside from the fact that, you know, we, uh, we, 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 we need to speak French uh, when we speak and when we stutter. No, mostly we, you know, can walk, go do essential things. You can go to the store. 
I think they've shut down most of the parks and like nature places insofar as there are those things here in LA. Uh, so, you know, my life is very much restricted to just being at home every 10 days or so. I do a little store run. Uh, you have to wear masks outside. So, uh, you know, I'm, I've been going for like the Michael Myers kind of thing. Um, <laughs> just kind of spook the neighborhood. Um, yeah, that's pretty much pretty much the extent of it, I think. And then, you know, like the whole industry, the whole movie industry and lots of other industries have been shut down. Wow. So, but, um, you know, daddy government is, uh, is, is taking care of us, you know, pa Papa Trump is uh, coming through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine LA kind of, it's like an extension of the culture that already exists there. People trying to like one up each other with their like quarantine outfits, like hanging out at Irwan with like, I don't know, the most decked out like masks and, and things like that. Quarantine just becomes another fashion, right? Yeah. I was actually yeah, thinking what it's, I would imagine. what's really funny to me is that um, you've seen those memes of like, um, you, the dolphins are returning to the rivers. Nature is healing. Yeah. Like that whole yeah. thing. Somebody sent me this, article where it was uh ben affleck and whoever his girlfriend is now were were sighted walking their dogs and it had a picture of them with masks on so i was like oh wow look at that celebrities can return to the wild <laughs> culture is healing because think about it celebrities can't go out in public because they'll be recognized but now everybody's masked could be anybody you know yeah yeah, it's great if you're like me and you try to avoid talking to people at all costs when you go into public spaces. It just like puts this extra level of, of barrier to interaction. Do you do, you do are you avoidant of conversation in in IRL? Because you don't seem very avoidant here. You're actually like welcoming long foreign <laughs> conversation, but you're selective, I guess. I'm I'm a I'm a discerning uh conversationalist. Mm -hmm. you know? Cause there's a lot of people that you get like kind of cornered into conversation with and yeah, it can be like uncomfortably uh, banal. Mm -hmm. But I, I really enjoy conversations when they're stimulating and creative and interesting. But do you but feel I, it, it? Do you feel it's up to you as well when you come across uh, a, a banal interface that it's up to you to provide what isn't there or to kind of like send that crackle of vitalization into the realm of the other? I guess potentially, yeah, that's true. But I, I also agree I with your discernment because some people are very much like um, vacuously in need, you know, they have this kind of like vortex, the vampiric vortex. But at the same time, I also feel like it takes so little in realms of encouragement to kind of fulfill somebody's flow and they'll take care of their, like if you just give them you know, the starter kit, you know, if you give them the SCOBY, of Cobrin, then, uh, <laughs> then just they like will have like a sheet printed out and be like, these are the topics I enjoy. We look over this, and just <laughs> pick, pick three that you enjoy. And we can talk about that. Yeah, something like that. Because you know, that's what I found originally when I first came to California. And I, I you know, I, I had been, um, I had encountered kind of like the visionary art culture online. And I had you know, caught wind of a lot of these, uh, these people that I know that, you know, you know, and that you've been, uh, you've kind of been raised in, in the light of, of their idolization in some degree. And I was really excited when I became uh, in close proximity of these people. And I, you know, I was traveling around with my portfolio, and I was really excited to share, I was in a very, like, ambitious and excited place and looking for the others and for community and had always envisioned that as something like I would meet these people, there would be a kindredness and there would be like an embrace and an openness. But instead, I was kind of met with this very reserved sense of indifference, which then led me to believe that this was kind of like a little secret society that were clicking together uh, and they were guarding a secret that they didn't have. And that right. by penetrating that, you would find out that there was really nothing there and just a bunch of like, kind of like bolstering fevered egos. And not everybody was like that, of course. Like actually, um, I remember I had, I had a little conversation with Luke Brown when I met him because uh, I showed an interest and I showed him some of my stuff. And he actually, I asked him about the fractal feline filigree. 
like yeah. where that came from like was that a vision and he told me the story of how him and Kerry Thompson and them were like in uh Dolly's house with Venosa and like went on a journey and he kind of brought that out of that experience but it was also influenced by Louis Wayne who was the the oh, guy yeah. who used to paint very classical cat portraits that then later on uh would become more and more demented the more he himself slipped into insanity and psychosis until he finally reached this kind of like fractalin DMT uh cat realm which was um so that you know there yeah, were like some moments but but there wasn't really like a a a connection or an embrace so it also again it feels like a navigation with a certain discernment and exclusivity i think that the visionary art scene is a collection of strange psychedelic introverts and so that's what you're going to get most of the time in interactions and i you can take it personally but you probably shouldn't because yeah. i think it i think that they like for the most part there's always going to be kind of like exceptions in any kind of group or community but i think for the most part visionary artists are well meaning but can and in the case of of many of the visionary artists i know this is the case be very sh- kind of like shy and, and socially awkward and introverted and their happy places in that like creative zone they want to communicate through the images that they create not so much on like one to one personal interactions and that makes once sense. you understand that then it's like oh it's not like oh they they want to exclude me or they don't like me but it's like oh this is like a very introverted person that mm-hmm. that's that's much more comfortable in front of a computer screen or a or an easel than they are talking to people that makes sense too because also like my identification with them or my desire to identify with that um was maybe also a blind spot in myself because i'm a uh if i dare say so myself a rather multidimensional individual so like i have even though i'm 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 an introvert. I have like extroverted tendencies as well. So I consider myself an astrovert. I'm so far in, it's far out, you know. It's like <laughs> I've got my satellites like beamed up into the sky, but I'm rooted into the earth. And I have a way of like engaging with people that could also be very overwhelming, especially to somebody that's like a little more reserved. So and at the time I wasn't as nuanced in my own empathic diplomacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean the I, I feel really connected with the visionary art community. I think that there are a lot of different facets to that also. And that's the thing. I mean, it's not just like the visionary art community. There's kind of worlds within that world also. Um, but I find that there's a, a lot of encouragement for artists in the visionary art community, much more so than other kinds of art scenes or art communities that I've been a part of because um you know like there's this whole kind of workshop scene that has blossomed out of visionary art and within that you don't need to be any you don't have to have any experience as an artist to be included into that and to be encouraged and to allow your creativity to be nurtured and other as long as you pay admission <laughs> <laughs> well in some cases not even because now Amanda Sage is doing this online vision train thing or any artist um can come online there's like a facebook group for it and i think that there it's are like other soul things. train for visionary artists right yeah it's like soul <laughs> <train>. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah you know you, you don't even need to do it like you already you got it already <laughs> i got that visionary mojo baby <laughs> yeah but yeah um i at least in in that group that kind of like budding artist aspiring painter workshop community which is a part of the visionary art scene i found that to be incredibly nurturing and supportive and not critical and like i come from the kind of concept art world where people were like really strict and really critical of each other's work and it was very rare to receive a compliment in that environment mm-hmm. actually people would if they're commenting on your work would mostly comment on what they thought was wrong about it or what could be improved which is helpful also for developing techniques sure. and stuff like that but it's not a very nurturing yeah environment yeah it's always you know? good so to when... have those kinds of things kind of like 
uh, pave the way with a compliment and then write the critique <laughs> in on that. You know what I mean? You're a nice but, painting, but uh, you <laughs> know, nice you painting. But here's what's wrong with it. Could... <laughs> what's What's interesting about you, I find, is um, that you've extended your art off the canvas and have kind of become the canvas to your own art through your your uh, your kind of like self designed tattoo identity if we can yeah. you know give it a term and uh i find it really fascinating because i was thinking about tattoos and i was thinking about like tattoo jokes because there aren't a lot of do you know any tattoo jokes <laughs> not really well i had two that came to mind and one of them is you know stephen wright uh -uh. he's a comedian that sounds really dull he was also the voice on the radio in reservoir dogs he'll say things okay. like uh I bought some batteries, but they weren't included, so I had to buy them again. He has these, like, <laughs> surreal one-liners, and he has one that goes, I got a tattoo of myself, full-body tattoo, but taller. <laughs> That's one. And then the other one I was yeah. thinking of is my, uh, it's not even really a joke, but it's it's just an anecdote that I wanted to share um, about my, my uncle, my my mother's brother, who was kind of a, crazy his name is case this is in the netherlands um and we called him crazy case because he was he's first of all he's an asperger most likely undiagnosed but my sister is a psychologist and kind of like felt that <laughs> one out um and he had he just has a lot of like weird eccentric behaviors and he actually recently sort of disowned my oldest sister who it's not like we're that close and he lives in brazil and it's not like we communicate that much but she got a tattoo on her arm and he doesn't want anything to do with her anymore because it's just like disrespectful to her body and um he has like this like weird aversion like also if like healthcare workers would come by and they have a tattoo he's like no you get get get, get out of here you know like there's really? This really weird stigma around it and when i Great. heard about that what really struck me as interesting <laughs> is that him on the podcast. Yeah, seriously. Oh man, he would he would despise you at first sight, just like completely prejudge you. That sounds but, like a positive experience. Yeah, but the funny <laughs> thing is, is that I remember in my youth he had this joke, and this is very inappropriate, but it gives you a very a funny impression of this person. He would say, "Oh yes, I have a tattoo." I have a tattoo of a tiger on my ass. And you'd be like, what? You have a tattoo of a tiger on your ass? You'd say, yes, would you like to see it? And then he would pull his pants down and show you his ass. And you'd be like, Where, where's the tiger? He's like, oh, it must have just crawled in the hole. And then he'd pull his pants back up. And you'd be like, what the fuck, dude? What the hell is that? But um, it's so interesting to me that somebody who has such a reservation against people inking their own sovereign skin has no problem flashing his ass in your face <laughs> under the pretense of a joke. So, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes. So. Yeah, you know, different, uh, different strokes for different folks. Yes, that, I found like the tattoo community, for example, is a lot more closed off than, um, than the visionary art community is in general. There's mm. like a much, there's a much higher standard in regards to what, quality your work has to be at in order to be kind of like welcomed in to that group mm. and it, it usually requires years of kind of rigorous hazing you know like people have to kind of earn their place in that community by going through a lot you first have to go through an apprenticeship which is usually like being a slave of sorts where you're just kind of like kicked around by the shop king and you know you're you're cleaning toilets for like two two to three years and then um you know, you have to go through these like painful initiatory processes of getting your whole body inked and the more intense the ink, kind of like the more respect you you gain because you have to go through more pain to receive it. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I've kind of like found my own place in that, you know, I found the like the sweet, fluffy ayahuasca drinking, sacred geometry, uh, sacred tattoo artists. Which well, yeah, you also you work a lot on kind of like the... The, the the patterning of the skin almost like the, the the camouflage of the mind worn on the outside that kind of patterning yeah I mean, actually... that's really my that's my uh, aesthetic ethos when it comes to tattooing is trying to create work that feels like it's a 
it originates out from the body. It's not something that you're imposing onto it, you know, and for my own body too, th those are the only kinds of tattoos that I want. Ones that are contoured and, and feel totally aligned with, with my form. I had this beautiful vision, like self-induced vision, just from a thought stream once about, uh, you know, the idea of a generic tattoo, you know, like I heart mom or an anchor, just kind of like your, uh, your everyday kind of like template. And then I was thinking yeah. about a, a genetic tattoo. Like Im imagine if you have two beautiful people, right? They have to be beautiful because we're imagining this, so why not? <laughs> and uh, oh, I mean, two ugly people, right? One of them's got warts all over the faces, right? And you're picturing this and you're festering, right? No, no, these are two beautiful people. And let's say he's got this um, serpent tattooed on his chest and she's got this beautiful bird like going up her side, like a lyre bird or something like really graceful. And then imagine these two people making love and their bodies entwining and swirling around each other like smoke, almost becoming fluid as they blend into each other. And then the, the ink starts flowing as well as if animated and they start merging together. So now the bird and the serpent also are like writhing around uh -huh. each other. And then a child is conceived from this union and the child is born with a feathered serpent on its body like a birthmark. This, wow. my friend, is the future. That's the future. Yeah, I got to get my best scientists on that. I'll get my once we're in Once we're in that. VR or we get into that AR tattoo realm, that's where things yeah. get really interesting, right? When the body itself becomes a kind of uh, textural, uh, cephalopodic, malleable kind of canvas, that's where things get really interesting. Because that's the thing that's always kept me from marking my body with a particular sign or symbol is that there's nothing I no static symbol that I would identify myself with forever. You know what I mean? And it is kind of like, it's the marking of the journey in a lot of ways. And it's like, well, yeah, it's like patches, like uh, boy scout patches, right? Like for, for valor or for uh, pain yeah. endured or hardship overcome or as aspirational something or other. But, uh, but if, once it gets into this kind of like fluid realm, I'd be very interested uh, to see what would come out of that. Yeah, I mean, my tattoos have never been to kind of like celebrate a particular thing. Like I'm gonna get this bird cause like I love birds or like I'm gonna get this band tattoo cause like I love this band. Like I, my mind is too fluid and changing to ever commit to something like that. But most of the tattoos on my body are prayers of, of certain kinds that are made with certain intentions for blessing or protection. And also it represents, yeah, my, my life's journey. You know, I can look back to a particular symbol on my body and remember exactly the place that I was in, in that time. It's like Memento. It's like the movie Memento. <laughs> yeah. You're trying to solve the, uh, the mystery of your life. So you're making marks so that you can be reminded of the, <laughs> the detective work. Yeah, if I ever like lose my memory, you know, I could at least like wake up in the hospital bed and be like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember. Right. That's who I oh, was. Oh, no, like, I have the clues right. like encoded in my skin exactly. to remember my identity in case my mind gets erased at any point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You keep your mind, uh, you wear your mind. Some people wear their heart on their sleeve. You wear your mind on your skin. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. But yeah, AR tattooing, that's that's going to be interesting. I think that when it becomes more prevalent that people are walking around with these kinds of, you know, um, altered reality glasses. And that's as common as having a smartphone that yeah, people probably will put on these kinds of like skins or mm -hmm. whatever, be able to download them or customize them. I was, think, like I was thinking of this career for that, of this thing. And I came up with the term kind of based off of the uh, Aurora, but it's like AR aura which would be like when you have those oh, yeah. glasses on and you see other people's auras, almost like a Yelp review shrouding them. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Or you see the dark cloud over someone's head because that's the program that they're running at that moment. <laughs> Cars in traffic it's would like have a like... Mood ring. Kind of, yeah, but like, like full body, full, full spiritual body mood ring or even mood ring mudras, you know? <laughs> But uh, like in traffic, you'd get like cars that are like almost like have this like cephalopodic chromatophoric uh, transmogrification of color going through them where instead of honking, you'd be like, oh, that guy's having a bad day. I'm just going to, you know, going to get out of the way. 
I, uh -huh. I just imagine it would be really interesting if that's where the future leads us to a more uh, almost like techno telepathic interface with the world, which is also, of course, you know, with the right kind of eyes, it's already kind of like that, but you still yeah. have to do, do the work to, to translate it. I, I guess also if it's an automatic thing, then, then people like yourself or like me are out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be amazing. I think probably more realistically, if the values of our culture remain the same though, we'll probably get kind of like that Black Mirror episode where people's yeah. like scores are, are showing their like social rank, you know. Or the so one, or the one got, where like, you get blocked and you just like this become this blur to other people. Yeah. Because you're like yeah. blocked out of existence for a little while. Exactly. I know that's, that's, that's the danger of like the, the technological interface rather than the, uh, the psychedelic interface of mind. Yeah, when we are, we already have that technology. It's called LSD. You know? yeah. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, where do you want to take this conversation, man? What do you? How do you see it going? What's your vision? When what? You, were, you, call, you called you me were... spiritual ventriloquist. So I kind of want to call you out on that and be like, "Yo, bro, okay. what's that about, man? I mean, I've been called worse, but what, what, what are you saying? Like, you think I throw my voice, bro? No, 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 no. The spirits throw their voices into you. Ooh. That's what like ventriloquist. Well, that's a very it's interesting. Like a it's basically a channel, you know. It's a very interesting way of, of, of putting it. It's true in a way. Yeah, it is like um, that. That is an, I was looking at it as the ventriloquism, like I'm like the ventriloquist. And I guess in old shamanic traditions, that was the case. Like shamans were these kind of like vocal acrobats that were able to throw their voice and like emulate different animal sounds and things like that. So that in the dark trance space, whether altered by sickness or altered by ecstatic drumming or or by some kind of uh psychoactive substance the the aud audience the participants in the ceremony would become susceptible to that and taken on a kind of vicarious theatrical journey to the underworld so in that sense i guess yeah i guess i'm kind of a uh, a shamaniacal <laughs> ventriloquist <laughs> i meant no insult man I, oh no i, I didn't i, I didn't take know, it as an insult I'm just, I'm just i'm just jiving with you man uh, I, uh, we were talking a little while ago, we were kind of throwing the idea out there of a uh, psychedelic puppet show with puppets made out of kind of the, the, the pantheon of psychedelic trailblazers. So, so you'd get yeah. your, your Terrence McKenna puppets that I would be able to voice in certain uh, rather hopefully convincing ways. And then you could have like a Dennis McKenna puppet as well which you gotta do make... the kind of like he does this like shoulder head twitch you know, well I, I i i haven't watched him very much i've just heard him speak but you could do kind of a reenactment of the la Chirera experiments and you, know, you could do like your um who else we got you go to robert anton wilson who would be much more like a, almost like an old detective or something like that the way he speaks about it all almost like very, you know, like crackly voice that comes in like that. It's like uh, investigating what happened to reality and the best way that we can navigate our way through it. Um, what else we got in that pantheon? Well, uh, I guess you got your William Burroughs, who would be a great puppet with his fedora and made out of some very dusty felt. Yeah, it would be a great show. If there, if there are any puppet makers out there watching later look at for some puppets based on these characters so please uh you know he, I, he, get some puppets right here. I know a guy yeah you're you're in like it's you're in like, like a, the henson central over there man <laughs> like henson yeah. henson sweatshops over there <laughs> henson sweatshops oh god <laughs> sweatshop muppets are the best that felt is so absorbent the sweat really just you perspiration and inspiration just absorb right into the puppet you could really work as like a kind of psychic medium you know and just just kind of go into these channeled states and then invoke these characters to like speak through you you know hold on hold and on something's, would, something's coming really through like that. something's coming through okay so it's coming through from the beyond. And, and so basically, what I wanted to tell you is that your mother is okay on the other side. She is trying to tell me she loves you very much. And, and... 
I don't know what just came over me, but I'm channeling people that are still alive. Yeah, man, I don't know what's happening with this whole lockdown situation, but you know, if things aren't going so well, you have that as a possible career path. Someone saying do Trump. The thing is Trump, there's a, a Trump impression, although it would be the best, the best impressions. It's tremendous, tremendous. Why not try it? But it's always like, it's, it's an impression of Trump impressions more than, because he's already been so depressed, so like overly uh, impressed upon that the impressions themselves have created the caricature of the man. I don't even think we can see the actual guy anymore because of all the filters through which he's been channeled and scrambled. I think he could be like a UFO, like he's a collective uh, apparition. You know? Yeah, and, and he, he, yeah, he's very he's much a like a Rorschach personality. Uh, where actually that's an interesting thing to touch upon because you know the whole like I injecting bleach trick that just came out recently where he yeah, was basically and then he said he was sarcastic have you ever seen the movie he didn't Being? Sound sarcastic. No, no no he was not even talking to the audience he was talking to the doctors but did you ever see the movie being there with peter sellers uh no it's a it's a great film i recommend it to everybody it's super feel good uh it's kind of like a forrest gump like trip of uh kind of like a slow-witted person who somehow like just rides the the wave to the top you know uh and so this guy he's this gardener his name is chauncey gardener and all he knows is really gardening he's very simple-minded but he goes through the world and everybody hears him and they hear whatever they want to hear in what he has to say and he comes into like the world of politics and they'll be like asking him some intricate question about the economy and then he'll just say like in the spring, the garden blooms. And in the summer, the garden flourishes. In the fall, and then they're like, he's absolutely right. We must take the economy to this. And they like interpret it as whatever they want. And I feel like that's what was happening when, when Trump came along and said the thing about that. Uh, and maybe we can look into that with light and, uh, you know, inserting the anti antiseptics into the, we can, we can look into that. And then people are like, you idiots, he's not saying inject with bleach. He's talking about UBIs. He's talking about ultraviolet blood irradiation. Duh. It's like it's just Rorschach stuff, you know? It's like whatever, yeah. whatever you want to project on him. No, oh, he's smarter than that. But if you look at just the transcript, it's like just kind of flying off the cuff. And some people are like, he's an idiot. And some people are like, no, he's much smarter than you think. But he's, he's what he, he is, what he is, you know? Here's what he is. Here's what he is. <laughs> Life is a Rorschach, right? And I think that it that is is, uh, is an interesting thing that is really being emphasized right now, even in this situation, because uh, the situation is neutral in a sense, and then people bring their meaning to it and their interpretations of it. And I've talked to primarily very hopeful spiritual type people Mm -hmm. who generally see this as some kind of intervention and healing for the planet, the collapse of systems that aren't serving us or aren't engineered for us to thrive um, as, as a, a human spiritual population. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of other people who see this as like a, a terrifying plague that they need to live in mm -hmm. fear from and there are so many different and then other people of course that see it completely as a uh conspiracy that there is no virus that it's it's a uh, you know sort of like fear uh, fear is the virus yeah it's <laughs> well, a, fear is the virus that fear is the, well, that there's that it's it's masking sort of like the the fall of the the global elite who are, are finally having due justice paid upon them or whatever it is. You know, I've, t I've talked to many different people that have many different perspectives yeah. on what's occurring. And it is, I mean, it, it, it is a Rorschach in that sense. That I, I, consider it, uh, our I consider it the Rorschach apocalypse because it sounds nice. Rorschach apocalypse. <laughs> but That's also, a good name for an album, man. I know, right? That works really well. We are Rorschach apocalypse. Um, <laughs> But, oh, you know, it's because it's because it's a it's the revelation of the Rorschach that is the mind. And I've I've kind of like some of my little branding slogans are like, uh, you know, life is a Rorschach worship workshop in the sense that 
you know, the idea of pareidolia, which you and I are both very familiar with, but for people that aren't, is the, the concept of finding uh, significant patterns in random data. So like faces in the cloud, Jesus on your toast, mm, Jesus toast, um, <laughs> these kinds of things. And um, I've kind of made the distinction in two parts where you've got pareidolia is the basic concept, but then you have uh, pareidolatry is the other side of it, which is the idea of like the idolatry of the image. So like, let's see, you see Jesus on your toast. You must always remember that your toast is just burnt. You know what I mean? It's just, you have to be able to find your way back to seeing the stain in the brain rather than just the apparition that shines through it. So like the people that, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, believe that it's all like a giant conspiracy or the people that think that it's like some kind of uh, metanoic breakthrough or, or however you might look at it it's always good to hold in mind that it's that and it's also many other possibilities so to really like bring it back to the the being comfortable in the space of not knowing yeah, and i that's I a remarkably buddhist idea actually it is it is yes. very much so it's like clear mind clear light of the void which again brings yeah. it back to the beginning like once you get past the iconic test screen on the tv that's like the buddha's head and once you slay that once the flat line of no more transmissions is set out of the way, you're left with the scrambled white noise of the channel into the beyond, which again is that like chaotic uh, exposition of mind, which then starts scrambling to find order and you start seeing all the possible transmissions in it. And that's the potent bardoic place that a bardo bard uh, like myself <laughs> likes to revel in, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, it, and in a way, I, I looked at this... I had one evening where I kind of had this um, kind of visionary epiphany about the situation where I viewed the virus uh, parading through the streets, almost like, like, you know, the image of the virus is like the circle with the little, like almost like a, like a time wheel or a prayer wheel that was kind of like, like a rumbling tumbleweed parading through the streets and people were like running from it. And some people almost like a video game were touched by it and then either would be booted out of existence and die, or they'd become anointed by this ultimately like God, they become crowned by it. And they would like, you see the guy, you see the image of the guy that's wearing the like plastic tubes yeah. on his head to keep yeah. people at bay to like have them honor this mandatory, um, what do you call it? Like, uh, the social uh, distancing. yeah, the restraining order is what I was going to call it, <laughs> like <the> social <laughs> restraining order. But he starts, he looks like the virus in that sense, right? He's like mm -hmm. wearing the like crown on his head. <laughs> so like yeah. people, people become anointed by this thing as if it is a God. And it is a God in the sense that it's birthing a new world. It's a God in the sense that it can kill. And it's a God in the sense that some people become uh, disciples to it and treat it with a kind of reverent mindfulness through which new rituals sprout up. Like when I come home from the store now, I don't just put all my items in the cupboards in the fridge, but I actually, at first I wipe them down and disinfect them with a kind of like reverent awareness of this thing that could potentially mm -hmm. take me out or could potentially birth a new world. And like our friend Michael Garfield had brought about is like this virus is not just infecting people, but it's inf infecting the system and it's infecting mm -hmm. the systemic virus that has been keeping uh, our minds ill and I'm probably butchering what he said, but the basic idea that the virus is really the system is existent in us. And this thing is coming along to crumble that down, to like compost it like a mushroom almost so that we get to like rebuild it in, uh, in the in new likeness, which is again, the, like from the pareidolatry of this is the world, which is a thing we created, like a human theatrical artifice that gets like deconstructed so that it can be reimagined like the Rorschach is the, the ever shifting paradigm. People are always talking about like paradigm shift. Like we're like swinging from liana to liana, but it's that intermediate space. Like, can you fly for a moment? Can you believe that you're actually flying as you're going between? And in that mm. liminal space, there's so much room to kind of juggle the molecular um, possibility zone into new configuration. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's helpful to grow more comfortable with the uh, uncertainty, you know, and to try to rest into that place that doesn't try to jump ahead 
to meanings or conclusions that can just really be with everything as it's happening, like day by day, step by step, mm -hmm. because we don't know, you know, we don't know yeah. what, what the future holds or how this will change us or yeah, we don't, what the, we don't what know the present we... holds either, right? Oh, no, we don't even yeah. know what the present, yeah, the present in, is. In, in a, a sense, we're, we're in like a quantum quarantine because like you don't know if you have it or not. Um, so that already is kind of somebody put a meme out there of like Schrodinger's virus. So the idea right. like, yeah, you have it and you don't have it as long as you don't know. But it's the quantum quarantine, which is very similar to the, the kind of, it's like a global long form ceremony, like very much like the, like an ayahuasca ceremony in that sense. And like everything that it's bringing up that we can't run away from that we have to somehow sit with. And in the sense that in, in ceremonial space, I've often had experiences that are, realer than real like visions that i've had like ex and visions for people that don't have these experiences is not like a visual uh experience necessarily it's actually fully immersive almost like vr like i call it vegetal reality right. but like a kind of like yeah. plant-based photosynthesized virtual apprehension that completely overtakes you with a reality that is more real than real and yet and there's also like the, the cognitive hallucination of objectivity often imbued to it, where you feel like everybody that's with you in the ceremony is with you in this experience. And then afterwards, when you try to talk to them about it, you realize that the most, the most mind blowing and profound experiences are like God jokes. Once you bring them back to the world, <laughs> like one God time, jokes. one time I had this experience of a, um, uh, there was basically like, there was all kinds of, rogue energy drifting into the room and it was like some really like nasty nasty shit you know and i was feeling very uncomfortable because the shaman was just remaining quiet and um wasn't like interfering with this and i just felt this stuff like like just like going going with chaos and just completely dispersing and then something burst into the room which was this luminous energy this luminous being that burst into the room and I couldn't see it, but I could feel and sense it to the point that I could envision what it would look like. And it had almost like these like multiple torsos of like pedal like propeller wings that were all like, like pedaling away like multi multi propellered wing blades. And it started just like flying through the room and all the energy in the room of everybody there and all the spirits presence were kind of like turning to it with a sense of luminous reverence. Like if like a celebrity walks into a cafe, the way people are like, oh my God, that's Angelina Jolie. You see that? Angelina Jolie. Wow. And they were all kind of whispering hmm. and they were saying, oh, it's a why, why? It's a why, why? Wow. Those are like so rare. It's like one of the most powerful healing forces in all the universe. I can't believe we're citing it. This is so <laughs> wow. important. And this linked into my mind and I was like, wow, this is very important. I have to remember this. This is a wowie wowie. This is a wowie wowie. And I could hear its location as it buzzed through the room. And then it was like right here by my, my left side of my ear. And then it like flew off and it was cleaning up the room. It was literally like sweeping up into its like vertical spiral, like a dust devil, angelic dust devil, like clearing all this space and taking it away. And then afterwards, I was convinced everybody had experienced this. So the first person I talked to, I was like, man, at one point when the wowie wowie came into the room and he was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? A wowie wowie? And I was like, yeah, oh, that, you, didn't ex you didn't experience the wowie wowie? Oh, that's, I thought that was like something everybody went through. And I realized it's like a God joke, you know? It's like you experience this profound encounter. And once you bring it back to the folks, it's just like completely absurd. Yeah, it is like that pareidolia thing, because what I've experienced in ceremony spaces is there is a cohesion to the ex to the experience, but it's more on an energetic level. Like there's ebbs and tides and flows of different kinds of textures of energy that's very abstract. But then the interpretation that you have of that experience is, is distinct and different from person to person. Like we all we're all experiencing yeah. that moment because we're all there together. And there is that kind of energy but then well at this well at the same time it's like one it's, it's like one oh. room with many rooms inside of it that's the yeah. weird that's that's kind of like the, the the quantum uh side of it all is that let's say there's five people in the room these are five people having drastically different uh experiences of what seems like the same room and in that sense we're all like together alone 
I keep getting it uh, cutting the feet cutting out, but you seem fine right now. Yeah, w what what just happened to me was that I'm gonna have to plug my phone in in, in a second. So hopefully my my microphone will continue to because uh, right now I'm going through through this thing right here. I think can you hear can you hear that? Let's let's try this out real quick. Yeah. Can you you still hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Yeah. Okay, great. Cool. We're going. We're going. But we're going to raw like, yeah, this I, thing without earbuds. We're going <laughs> to raw god this. Sorry, raw god it. I'm going to keep it spiritual. <laughs> yeah, lately I've felt increasingly more fascinated with the realization of how different the realities that different people exist in are, just based on our perspectives and beliefs and ideologies and neurochemistry and whatever it's like we are, we are here to some extent in the same place but yet depending on those different factors we're having completely different experiences of what it is to be an embodied presence in this time and that's really fascinating to me because mm -hmm. I think that then you could argue that any of those subjective realities are not real and that then you have to really dig to find what is objective reality within that. Yeah, exactly. You gotta, you gotta peel, peel it away till you get to the, to the core of it. It's like a fun house of mirrors, right? That tries to isolate infinity, but it's really just reflecting itself on all sides. And we got to somehow embody the feeling of infinity, which is again, like, PR men for infinity like you and I come along to try and <laughs> lead the way. I had this insight yesterday that if we're not here to make treasure maps, maps to things we treasure, then what are we here for? If we're yeah. not here to leave these, these marks behind through which to uh, usher future generations fluently through the flesh, then you know, what, 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 are, what kind of world are we creating? I think of uh, the art I make sometimes, it's like the little light on the angler fish or something mm -hmm. like that. Or, you know, that's kind of like what visionary art is in a way to, to somebody may see that and be like, oh, wow, what's that? But then get like subsumed by this much greater and in some cases much more ferocious yeah. mystery, you know, that they, they kind of like ended up at through visionary art. I actually have, I have an illustration of that. Uh, with a caption in relation to um, the shamanic experience where uh, something that a shaman told me was that, you know, a lot of people come to ayahuasca for the visions, but the visions are really almost like a, a bait to lead you into much darker and subtler realms of the medicine. And uh, I've been putting together, I've been digging into the landfill of my amassed writings and pulling like handfuls out to create like a little book with art and like a little graphic novel. And that's one of the pages that I, I've, I've put together is about is a picture of the angler fish and somebody swimming towards it like Ooh, pretty light. And then it's just like going straight, straight into the jaws of hell. <laughs> and hell is a place to get well, you know. Hell is the place to get well. I like yeah. that. My, yeah, my friend um, Aslan Reif of the band Honeymoon Tree, he has a song called Mobius Trip. And there's a line in there. He says, there's no irony in hell. It's a place to get well which I, I love and I, I highly recommend anybody because it's uh, maybe Bandcamp weekend is over, but still check out honeymoontree.bandcamp.com and listen to some beautiful music with beautiful lyrics. Awesome. Yeah, man. I, um, I had another thought that just eluded me. It's gone now. Oh, it's a terrible thing when that happens, but... Uh, yeah, I think it. Ha I might as well just segue into that. I think it had something to do with uh, my podcast, self portraits as other people, which uh, I also uh, uh, anybody listening, I, I invite you to check it out. Which actually, through there, I've started publishing little pieces of writing, like spoken word and soundscaped pieces of writing that have never before been seen um, to lure people, much like an anglerfish, into my Patreon patreon.com slash void denizen where i'm actually starting to publish more um spoken word iterations of ch written chapters from manuscripts so that people can kind of like further immerse themselves into these worlds that um 
my friend Jennifer Sodini recently described the style in which I do this as imagination cinema, which I've embraced fully because I think it's such a beautiful way to describe that uh, kind of like what, modification of imagery and, and sound and word. What that reminds me of is I listened to a, a Terrence McKenna talk in which he was talking about the way that ancient cultures who use medicine, these shamanic cultures treat art and how the Ikaro is, is like a, a virtual, it's like the, the installation for the VR program, you know? Yeah. So like people are, are, are in that ceremony space, they're on the medicine and they would sing these certain songs and transmit these certain frequencies that would bring people into an experience within that kind of, uh, yeah, vegetal reality state as you called it. Can you send and, me the link to that talk? Because that's very I'll, much I'll find it. very much yeah, but, the stuff I've been, was... been writing about as well. And I call them Icar OS. Like Icaros with the OS kind of uh, yeah. uh, capitalized because it's the operating system. And it's very much the remote control with which uh, the experience is. And it's again, like I, I describe it too, like the, the breath and the sound is very much the the Rorschach again, through which people hear the same song, but different associations come about. And it's almost like a pantomime with this, like this, it's, it's this channel where you just kind of like has these pneumatic tube messages inside of it, just like barreling the shoot with like undifferentiated discourse that everybody will receive the same sound and the same like tones and interpret it and unfurl it in their own to, mm. to, release their own message, which is such a powerful and beautiful terror. <laughs> yeah. I just did, um, I, I've been involved with this Evolve and Ascend uh, isolation tank platform, which is uh, basically like once or twice a week, a bunch of thinkers and artists, including Michael Garfield, Michael Phillip, and Jennifer Sudini and uh, Sophia Rockland, a bunch of people come together and share ideas and kind of like riff on different themes. Uh, and the last one was about uh, picturing a more beautiful world. And it became kind of a philosophical exploration of what beauty is and beauty as related to terror. And kind of the conclusion I drew from it in a nutshell was this sort of that the, the terror of, of confronting beauty or confronting something transcendent is that when you see the shadow or see the terror or the monster, you realize that that's you. That's the terror of the beauty. And yep. the beauty of the terror is when you embrace that as you, when you can actually accept and integrate that. Uh, but it's the, the, the talk is out there. I think we riffed for a good few hours and went a lot of places with it, but it was, I felt it was worth kind of plugging that thing as well on the, on the topic of what we've been riffing yeah. on. Yeah, in, our, uh, in the shadow workspace, it's kind of like an old superhero cartoon or something where they pulled the mask off of the villain. They're like, let's see who this really is. And then you just pull it off and it's you every time. You're like, oh, I would have got away with it too if it hadn't been for my other personalities. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's so much of the healing process that is just reckoning these aspects of ourselves that we were ashamed of or that we find uh, difficult to tolerate, that we're agitated and annoyed by. Yeah. You know? And like learning to make space for that and to, to love those parts of ourselves and kind of trust that the way in which we are naturally is okay. And the way in which we yeah. were created is all right. And that there's nothing wrong with us, you know? The, the shadows that control us, if we can somehow love them into submission. Yeah. You know, then you can have your own little pet apocalypse on a leash and then you can <laughs> use it as a power rather than as a force that, that's seeking to destroy you and use your vulnerabilities as a strength and as a power. I, uh, you know, you know, little Dicky, right? The comedic yeah. rapper guy really you don't know Little oh. Dickie, I'll have to check Wor that out. worth checking out very very smart very funny guy but he just got a show on fx called dave which i was really quite impressed by where he went with it because he's a rapper and of course the rap scene is always very much like a lot of machismo and bravado and materialism and this kind of like you know posturing of of this kind of like um uh, masculine idealization and he's just like this like Jewish dude who calls himself Little Dicky because he has a small penis and like he just like <laughs> comes in fronting with all his shortcomings or insecurities and he just like uses them to his advantage in such a way that it empowers others to also step up and reveal the tenderness of their hearts 
and it's just so oh, full, wow. of, full of heart and full of soul. And it reminds me of uh, the final verse in that Saul Williams song, Black Stacy, where he's talking about, you know, all these, these gangsters that are like posing with their like gold chains and they're like, they're so tough and everything. And he's like, yeah, but if you can reveal your heart to us, we'll nod our heads to its beat and, you know, bring all the addicts and bring everybody along because I'm putting a posse together. And by the end of this, I hope everybody will load their guns with songs they haven't sung. And it's like, fucking gives me goosebumps and chills every time because it's such an, an empowering exposition, you know? Like if we can show where we hurt and where we're insecure and where we feel like we're, we're not on par with kind of like the image that, you know, the perfected image, then it empowers others to also step forth and we can have conversations and heal and really like play in the dirt, you know what I mean? Yeah, amen. Yeah, I think a lot of the most talented creators I know that have the kind of most unique vision, we're getting a, a countdown, I guess we only have two minutes left. Um, we could, if you want, like go, go back on for a little bit. Um, Either way. Of, but yeah, a lot of the most unique kind of visionaries I know are really, uh, they've really dismissed any trying to fit into any kind of like social norm, you know? And just by being completely okay with their own strangeness and uniqueness, then that empowers their work to also just kind of like veer its own course completely without any shame or caution or, or fear of it not being accepted. And yeah, I think that's- So it's interesting to see really what- what kind of moths gravitate toward that kind of vortex of light, you know? Some strange, yeah. strange creatures will, uh, will wash upon that shore every time. Yeah. The more strangeness, the more beauty. A lot of my favorite artists and a lot of my favorite bands were always these kinds of like underground cult following type organizations that had like a very small, but very dedicated fan base because they were quite strange and underground and unusual. I think mm -hmm. that, yeah, to a degree, I've, I've more aspired to something like that in, in, in my own work. Yeah, it's, it's an excavation process of that which is uniquely you being able yeah. to, to shamelessly expose that to the world. Cool, man. Um, well, let's, uh, this is going to end here in a second. You want to, we can hop back on for a, a little bit and maybe take some questions and see if there's sure, any yeah. that sounds, dialogue and discussion. That sounds like fun. Alrighty. I'll see you All in right. a sec. Yeah. I missed you, man. You caught me. You caught me sucking at the teeth of the Sorn Cup. Look at this beautiful Sorn Cup. Wow. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to talk here soon. That'll be cool. I'm excited nice. about it. Hey, yeah. I got him, uh, he's the next guest on uh, lined up in the barrel of uh, self portraits as other people podcast. I, I'm still working on the intro because, uh, you know, because, so I got, <laughs> but it's, com it's coming in like the next couple of weeks. I'm going to put that episode out, which I'm very excited about because we did a lot of talk about kind of like world building and deep listening and kind of like yeah. the receive and transmit like masculine, feminine, um, swirl of, of, of unified opposites, uh, which I think are very, potent themes even though it was recorded pre-quarantine they're very potent themes for right now you know mm. yeah his work really reflects that too because his uh his vocal range can be quite feminine at times and very kind of uh i don't know fragile but yet there's oh, yeah. also the, this sort of like masculine voidliness to what he creates also well especially in his earlier work when he had the 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 drums backing him up there was a very oh, much yeah. like the like, kind of like primal scream masculine force. But there's also, you know, his mother was an opera singer who didn't bring a career to fruition. And in a way, I feel like he oh, wow. channels the, 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 the unsung voice of that legacy. And also like Cradle, what you're saying with the vulnerability, like, uh, the, like the lost souls of these children that he's crafted into these characters. But there's very much like, it has a lot to do with, with inner child work and a kind of, loss of innocence and the like mm. finding voicing that towards redemption almost like a sung shakespearean soliloquy wow but enough you, should, you should be his pr guy <laughs> I, I kind of was at some point i mean a, yeah, a, lot, I of, a lot of people learned about him through through this guy yeah i'm so excited to talk to him i mean i've met him a few times but the conversations that we've had have been 
only very brief, like after one of his workshops or something like that, or oh, the side of a so stage much, somewhere. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Oh, it's sweet of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much yeah that's what i got that's what i got yeah. so i'm excited to uh dig a little deeper and have an opportunity to really pick his brain and see what's going yeah. on and pick it back <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i wanted to open this up if uh anyone has we can take a we have 12 apostles we can do right some improv improv improvisation we can have uh, topic suggestions or uh we can do questions too i don't i don't know if he's still there but um my friend robert i saw him come by earlier when i was telling the anecdote about my uncle he said uh the real tiger king which was funny i smiled at it as i saw oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I saw Sergio yeah. Santura was, was here with us for a little bit too, oh. which was really nice to see him popping by. He's a very talented, pareidolic artist. Yeah. yeah. But it, does, it doesn't look like any questions are popping up here, so. Well, yeah. The unquestionable ungoogleable. That's because I guess that we came through cohesive enough in our message that we just gave um, everybody somebody the got one. they were searching for. somebody got a question how are you feeling about the use of psychedelics in this time i mean that's entirely a personalized decision i've had a few instances in which i felt like i wanted to delve in but it's funny because i'm a very psychedelic and psychoactive personality and yet i don't partake in substances very often at all and it's most of the time it's not the right time if you know what i mean so it's been like almost a year since the last time i took anything uh, but there's been like some moments where I felt like, okay, maybe tomorrow, or maybe this day will be a day. But the times are so potent and intense already that I feel like it's that space is kind of already accessible in an intense enough way as is. But at the same time, this is also a good kind of like set and setting in the sense that, you know, you're not going to get interrupted. You know, nobody's mm -hmm. going to come at your door or, or whatever, you know, if you're in a yeah, I think that it's, it's potentially a um, very good time to go into those spaces. I think that microdosing, honestly, is something that would be a great benefit to the masses right now. I have found that when I microdose, it just alleviates a certain amount of anxiety. You know, it kind of takes the edge mm -hmm. off and helps me ground more into my body and be present and um, not get lost in these kinds of whirlwinds within my mind. And I think that if people had access to microdoses right now, I think it would be a tremendous medicine and support for what people are going through. You know, it just would help people kind of be at ease a bit more and relax more into the circumstances and situation and potentially help people tap into a more creative space as well. And I don't think that you have to be very cautious about microdosing. I think that if you're a mentally stable person that it can be done at any time and in any occasion mm. without really much fear about the repercussions of it. But in terms of larger doses of psychedelics and going into deeper spaces, I think that's really up to the individual. And for me, there's, there's kind of just, I guess there's two ways in which that happens. One is I'm presented with it, which is, you know, I'm invited into a ceremony or something like that, or, or a friend is like, we're doing this thing, like, come on. Or it's like I receive a whisper, you know, uh, a whisper that arises from some kind of inner knowing that I need to touch back into that space to remember something that perhaps I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, it's up to every single person to listen to their inner voice and their inner guides for when it is a good time or not to partake in that experience. also placebos are extremely powerful so i also recommend like take a wedge of an orange slice as a sacrament and see where it takes you because anything that you take with intention and that has a digestive process will uh, you know send you on your way if you take it with the right kind of mindset i saw yeah. another question come by where somebody was asking where they can learn more about pareidolia and uh I mean, obviously you can Google it, but I, I do talk about it quite a bit on 
different platforms and in different podcast appearances and in my own podcasts and um, in the descriptions with a lot of my artwork. So if you go to my website, voidandimagination.com and start poking around, especially there's one section in the art galleries called Stain Spotting, which is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of, I turned every walk in San Francisco into an event by wandering around and keeping a, a stick of chalk with me where I would outline whatever shapes I'd see in stains on the sidewalk. And then I'd take pictures of them and post them. Uh, and this was for me also a really potent way of showing the way we projection map almost automatically our perceptions upon the world at large and then just accept them as the real world out there. Because when you start wandering around and stains on the sidewalk start looking like faces and you can't unsee them, you realize that we're constantly taking the world in, processing this raw information upside down, inverted and backwards, battering it with our own perceptions and then immediately simultaneously projecting it back out there and perceiving it as external. So that's a really interesting practice that you can also adopt to further investigate pareidolia for yourself in a playful way. And also in a very uh, philosophically significant way in an alchemical sense where you take excrement and turn it into sacrament, where you take something filthy and discarded and you, you, you basically grow flowers from the compost and take a stick of chalk, which is usually used to outline where the dead have fallen and now outline where the imagination arises and re retain a connection with the unconscious, the illuminated unconscious and the interface of the imagination that shines from beyond the material plane. So the material plane, alchemically speaking, becomes a springboard into the metaphysical plane. And it's also just a really fun thing to do, you know, I mean, like you can do it with kids and stuff. You don't have to get all like heady about it and time just fun mm -hmm. and stuff. You know? Yeah, that takes me back in a way to just walking around San Francisco and finding these, these little artifacts that you created everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's funny because I, I knew the neighborhood by its stain. I knew where different stains <laughs> resided, which is a really weird thing when you walk by and you're like, oh, yeah, there's that one everywhere. And sometimes yeah, you'll see totally. different things in the same landmark you know which is also cool because then it shows you that the mind is also always shifting and growing and any challenge we face is ultimately a challenge of the imagination you know mm. it's like it's the inability to reimagine something or look at it from a different angle so it also gives you that that flexibility if you will to kind of like again like we were saying earlier find that kind of like molecular juggle that liminal space mm. yeah somebody, somebody here says you are a psychedelic um we, we, I think we are. I, I don't know if you're talking about these yeah. particularly or in general, but Probably. It, is, it is my aspiration to uh, incarnate as an entheogen. And I do my best <laughs> to project my essence into my creations so that even when I'm gone, that those lessons can unfold and unfurl. And I actually did a short essay called Becoming an Entheogen that touched on to that. Um, yeah, in, in my next life, I'm hoping to incarnate as an ayahuasca vine and to be consumed by a, a CEO of a tech corporation to help them discover the next million dollar app idea. You know, mm. I think that uh, that's and really my call it vine. reincarnation. It's already been done. Dude. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was actually, in that, to... I mentioned it in that essay, there was in Pablo Amaringo's Ayahuasca Visions book, he talks about the origins of ayahuasca as this king who passed away and then from his grave grew this liana, this vine, which he had set up as a pipeline to the other side, like a communicative line, a line of communication essentially to his offspring. And that's the idea that if you take ayahuasca, that's actually the, you know, it takes you into this kingdom. Although I think of it more as like the vegetal queendom in that sense. But so yeah, it's very possible. And I like your um capitalistic twist <laughs> on it somebody says curious to hear your thoughts on all the conspiracy th theories surrounding what we're going through i'm pretty neutral and usually just hold space for anyone who comes to me with their theories what do you think is really going on yeah i think we kind of touched on to that earlier when we were talking about the the rorschach apocalypse in the sense of right. keeping like keeping a, a fluidity of mind um, you know, yeah, take, take it all, take it all into consideration, I'd say, but don't, 
attach yourself to things that you can't be entirely sure of knowing and always question your sources and always right. question people who push a certain theory on you and but won't give you their sources and say research it for you do your own research because what if you go out into the vast field of information and misinformation and you come back with a different conclusion it's like okay if somebody has a certain position that they're pushing let them back it up with where they get these ideas from and let them also be honest about presuppositions and hidden agendas within their own minds uh and the again the shadow projection you know the boogeyman mm -hmm. that you see out there is oftentimes like a comforting buoy for just the chaotic ocean in which we drift for some people the chaos of the conspiracy theory and the idea that someone else is in control of your destiny and your sovereignty can also be more comforting than the idea that we're in complete chaos and that we have the responsibility to to take care of things but like i say take it all yeah. into consideration weigh it with uh with an equanimous mind yeah Go your head begin again <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely um i guess for some people it's more comforting to have an idea of what's going on even if it's horrific and uh deeply anxiety provoking than to just not know what's going on entirely and i've always been a little bit of an anomaly within psychedelic culture because i although i enjoy a good conspiracy theory or i enjoy a a good uh you know narrative that's outside of the the typical mundane i'm not that fascinated with conspiracy you know like new world order type conspiracy ideas in general like a lot of my friends seem to be and um when i've looked into that stuff i i mean i'm very open to hearing everything and to weigh it with a a discerning mind but when i do my own research into different ideas that people hold i usually find something that discredits the whole story you know like there there will be it's self dissolving in a way isn't it all the different once you look into enough sources it kind of dissolves itself out and i find also right. that a lot of these things that are put forth these different ideas or theories it doesn't offer necessarily a solution or a way to tackle it it just kind of like hits them right where it hurts right in the hypotheticals yeah. <laughs> right in the hypotheticals yeah right yeah i think that you know i value the state of my consciousness very highly that i value more than knowing what's going on in a way mm -hmm. you know like if i knew what was going on but it would render me incapacitated in some kind of just like fearful coma and and just in total terror i would take my peace of mind and not knowing over that you know yeah absolutely yeah that's the that's the danger of that trap is that you give up your autonomy to force it in control in control of of what exactly like ultimately i think bob marley had the right idea you know when he says emancipate yourself from mental slavery none but you can free your mind like that's mandela mm -hmm. too right it's like imprisoned yeah. but free in the places where nobody has autonomy and the unbroken spirit and and i think that that resilience is the thing to that's the ultimate buoy you know that's the ultimate uh life raft is 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 that's your craft i have i have a song which is called silent sirens which is the idea of traveling past the isle of the sirens and the lines are sailing past the silent sirens i request of them a song cuz you know my ship's been reckless for unfathomably long if you should should you choose to raise the dead be sure to raise them well or you might grow up to become or they might grow up to become a living hell and then the mm. chorus is with my craft as my raft we brace the rowdy rapids and row the best way to navigate any chaotic situation is creation is finding yeah. as as our uh our our buddy um Lee McCloskey once said is like by working with the tools of creation to explore the creation that's the ultimate kind of like meta 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 tuning fork attunement to higher realms where where in the chaos you get to not only create but divine what is true to you like for me my i, I don't consider myself a visionary artist because of like, the stigma around that term like i'm more of like a divinatory artist because it's about conjuring and divination from the paradolic chaos 
things start shining forth. And as I bring them about, I don't know what I'm creating, but it's creating me as much as I'm creating it. And then after it's done or it gets to a place where it becomes discernible, it starts telling me like very like psychedelically, very mind manifesting manner. It starts telling me what I know on a deeper level to be true or true to me. And I think that's so much more potent is our inspiration theories are more potent, I think, than conspiration theories, inspiracy mm -hmm. theories, I should say. Yeah. There was one thing that kind of struck me as a little bit odd, though. And I mean, I researched this and went down the rabbit hole a bit. There was a conference that was held about pandemics before the COVID-19 situation broke out that was, I think, in part funded by Bill Gates and he was in, in attendance and they gave out these little plushies of COVID molecules to every person that attended. And that actually happened. And, and so yeah. when I looked into that, the conspiracy debunkers were like, well, they didn't know that that was going to be the molecule that would create a mass global pandemic. And it was just a coincidence that they gave out these like stuffed coronavirus molecules to all the attendees and, and spoke of it uh, so extensively. But that did happen, you know, and- The, the gates keeper, huh? He's the gates keeper <laughs> to the windows of the, of the soul vacuum. I wonder how oh, much true. those little uh, coronavirus plushies are worth now though. They're right. like a rare beanie baby or something like that. Yeah, well, it's interesting because reality really is stranger than fiction in that way that like, with the right kind of eyes, you start noticing the the symbols around you. And they're basically, again, they're like divining constellations of meaning that aren't necessarily objective, but they are pointing towards the direction of what you know, you know, like, so I was, I make the distinction between like a synchronicity and a synchronicity or, uh, or like synchronastiness, because that happens too. Like I've had it before where it's like a synchronicity where it's like the universe goes like, it's like winking at you and you're like, oh yeah. And you walk through that door and the door slams shut and the breeze that seems so powerfully to blow like settles down. And then you're like, wait, but I thought you told me. And it's like, oh no, sorry, dude, I wasn't winking. I just had some uh, stardust in my eye. And then the universe <laughs> leaves and you're like, you're like, what? So it's like, I feel like a synchronicity is often like, it's like a beautiful woman winking at you from across the room. And instead of going up there to talk to her, you go, oh, wow, everybody, you see that? She's winking at me. It's like, bro, that's, that's your, that's your synchronicity. Like work with it. Like don't tell everybody. Oh, I saw it since 11, 11. It's like, so what? How many times you look at the clock today? Right. If you have multiple yeah. clocks in your house and you set them to different times, your uh, chances of catching 11, 11 increase <laughs> monumentally. That's what I do. I just got tons of clocks. They're all yeah. set at different. 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, Yeah, exactly, man. But, yeah, yeah, but that I, is I uncanny. When, I, when but, I look into that, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you could explain that. I mean, one, the more kind of a malignant explanation is that it was something that they constructed intentionally and they were sort of celebrating this outbreak through distributing this little toy to everybody, et cetera. I mean, another way of looking at it is they had no idea that that was going to be a virus that actually created a mass global pandemic. And they just happened to coincidentally choose that one. But molecule why were they, the why were they giving out plush little uh, <laughs> Corona to like, what, what do you know what conferences are like conferences? They give you a lot of free stuff. Always. You always get that like little goodie bag when you go into a conference. You know, you give it to your this, kids. You know what I call that? A conference conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. But it also could be a, a, a sort of premonition, right? Like the person that was organizing that wasn't even aware of what they were doing, but they had a kind of They've intuition like a or premonition charge. <laughs> around that. They've got like a shamanic sip. Uh, they go to this oracle to ask him, so what shall we give away to him? <laughs> Here's my design. And they give the design of like this coronavirus you know like, all right mass produce this give it out we won't question it uh-oh you have a little um turning i can't hear you man yeah you have a little turning wheel over your third eye oh there you are you had a little turning wheel over your third eye things got very strange for a moment i guess i spoke too much okay i think i got you and we're back
No, we had a little weird little lag. Anyway, do you have any more questions from, from the, the crowd? I'm seeing some uh, laughter emojis. Tickled some funny bones. We got gaga ha ha ya 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 ya. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna answer that. You want to take that one? <laughs> what what is it? Gaga ha ha ja 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 ja. I'm not oh, yeah. that one. Totally. No, thank you. That laughter is too infectious for me. I'm gonna wear my mask and start some mumble rap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Was so, just something else about that like situation is that it could also be this invocation. I wonder sometimes I feel like our ideas around causality are not that um, well, they're not as evolved as they could be. I think that things kind of arise simultaneously. It's not so much that this thing happens and then linearly this in the chain, it knocks over the other domino and that happens. So it could also be that the act of doing that, of focusing so much energy around this virus going viral and creating this mass pandemic and having all these sort of leaders in that field focusing mental energy onto that and collectively imagining that happening, which is what they were doing. Like they invoked it through their... Uh... That, that kind of like, that they invoked it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's what people do in like magical ceremonies and stuff like that, is that they, they use visualization and imagination and concentration to invoke something. Yeah, never underestimate know? the powers of bureaucracy and municipal magic. You know, like yeah. you always, you know, the, the, what is that called? Like the threefold uh, rule or something like that, the rule of threes. It's kind of like fill it out in triplicate. Only the, the, the rule of threes is like if you cast the spell and it doesn't take, it comes back to you like threefold, that sort of thing. Oh. But yeah, I mean, business in a sense is kind of like municipal magic and it is kind of a mm -hmm. uh, casting of spells, making of agreements and alliances. There is a very like, though it's kind of disguised in suit and tie, m you know, mundanity, there is definitely the same principles are at work. Like, yeah. Was, ah, coronavirus is a mish technique by the universe. Is that what you're saying? Um, it is a it is a mixed technique. That's for damn sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> like the old masters used to do. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is like what the old masters did. You know, they had that black plague. We got the coronavirus. It's like mm -hmm. old master technique. <laughs> yeah, bringing it back. That's right. Cool, man. Well, this was fun. Yeah, I really enjoyed this. I appreciate this the first, it. First time I did this, and I didn't get too many uh, people commenting on my face. Not commenting on my face, but too many comments crowding my face. Which uh, I, next I time we can that. we can play around with the different uh, masks and effects, like oh, this yeah. one. Look at that. Yeah, that's that's tight right there. You know, which Banned which makes anonymity. It, it either makes these uh, conversations more distracting or more interesting, depending on how you look at. It. This one's good. Yeah, like we could have done the whole conversation like this. Oh, I wish you had done that. Hey, somebody <laughs> just said, you know, you guys know the DMT cat presences. Is that a thing? Uh, listen to the earlier conversation because I actually touched on to uh, Luke we Brown totally and Louis, Louis Wayne and, and, and Wayne's world and uh, trippy cat aesthetics. So that's definitely, I recommend to whoever said that to revisit the earlier parts of this conversation because it is in the end, a kind of linear progression and not just a random bit of sound bites and memes, though very easily it could be that. <laughs> yeah, Louis Wayne is interesting because like he was schizophrenic, but his visions were so archetypally psychedelic and so similar to DMT type experiences. So it, I mean, it could provoke the argument that there could be something that has to do with endogenous DMT. Uh, if somebody is having a schizophrenic episode, you know. Yeah, I mean, that, that, it makes sense. When you look at his aesthetic and, and just the, uh, the nature of, I mean, psychedelics used to be considered psychotomimetic, the idea that they would mimic the, the psychotic state. So that's, you know, like a, a, a reverse engineering. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> 
yeah, another that's fun. person that's here fun right commented on apocalypse being the lifting of the veil. Absolutely. Uh, that I was saying, like, it's like revelation. It reveals what was already there and um, it just exposes the inherent weaknesses, flaws, and blind spots in our awareness in a way that we can, you know, integrate them into our being. Mm. Can, you know, totally instead of throwing shade, absorb that shit, man, absorb that. Yeah, go forth and integrate. Yeah, anoint yourself with the ashes of your departed self-image, you know? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. That's the, yeah. the exfoliation of the soul. That's what we're talking about here. I think that one of the most powerful acts that we can do in life is to own the sovereignty of our innocence. Like to come back mm -hmm. fully to ourselves, who we were before we became indoctrinated and programmed, and to just stand in solidarity in that. And that is uh, also an act of radical defiance against the system because the system needs us to play roles that aren't our natural essential selves in order for that system to continue. And the system is really just a bunch of little systems that are run in our own OS. So yeah. your rage, yeah. against, rage against the machine is really a rage against engineering your own machinery and oiling it well, you know, and like operating your own... Uh, what did you say? Sovereign, tr tr sovereign innocence. Sovereign innocence. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, it is. What, it what is, is basically adult, like? What is an adult but a skilled child? If you do it right, if you grow up and glow up the right way, then you really you can retain the childlike innocence and play, but refine the skill with which you strategize uh, and intentionalize your trajectory through life. Yeah, man. I just yeah. winked my third eye at you. Beautiful. And, uh, yeah, I think that's a great place to wrap it up. So thanks so that's much good. for coming on this live stream, man. Let's do this I, again sometime. Pleasure. If anybody wants to check me out, uh, obviously I'm on Instagram. Uh, obviously I'm on Instagram and uh, voidandimagination.com is where you can find art, film, writings, uh, music. You name it, man. Podcast, voidandimagination.com. Thank Lots you, of Thank you Jacob. on Renaissance sculptures and Ninja Turtles and all kinds of good stuff on that website. Absolutely. It's a, <laughs> I love when people say quantum renaissance, like it means something really. Or it's, oh, yeah, the qu quantum, quantum renaissance. Yeah. <laughs> all right, man. Enjoy your evening. Much love. See you soon. Peace, brother. Peace. So we did it, guys. That was another episode of the Quarantine Sessions podcast. I am the host. My name is Jake Cobrin. I want to thank you again for tuning in and listening to this episode, and I hope that this was a valuable experience for you. If you're interested, you can watch these podcasts live on Instagram. I am doing between three and four live podcasts per week. And if you want to find that, my Instagram account is underscore dot cobrin dot underscore just for aesthetic embellishment. And please subscribe to this podcast so that you can be notified of further episodes. And that's about it. Many blessings to you wherever you might be. I love you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Be well. <laughs>